Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Wilners Podcast. This is mini episode number seven. My seven. name is Slater, and I'm here with Eric and Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Hello. Yo. Adam's <laughs> at work still. Yeah. So this episode is a little different than our usual. Um, we actually have an interview clip from um, some of the crew involved in this special coming out on Disney Plus on April 22nd, Earth Day, um, called Secrets of the Whales. And it's a National Geographic four-part series that's going to air on Disney Plus. And we got to talk to uh, Nat Geo photographer Brian and the composer Raphael. And we're so excited to be able to chat with them. It was a really brief little interview for their press day, but um, we were really stoked to be able to have behind the scene access to the series. Um, and we have watched all the episodes many times because, you know us, we're just huge whale nerds. And um, then we got to talk to Brian and Raphael. So we are going to uh, play the interview and then um, we'll have a little bit of a post interview wrap up as well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's exciting. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's get into it. Um, first, right. we'll start with uh, we want to hear a little bit of a, a brief background from each of you. Um, so whoever would like to start first, just kind of like, you know, we, we can read your backgrounds online and all that good stuff. Right. But we like hearing kind of your story a little bit and then we'll talk more right. about the film series. Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, please. Okay, thanks, Raf. Um, well, hi, everyone. Yeah, um, so my name is Brian Scarry. I'm an underwater photographer, photojournalist, producer, specializing in marine wildlife. And um, I started diving in the late 1970s in Massachusetts, where I lived most of my life. Um, you know, grew up in a little sort of um, mill town, a, a blue collar textile mill town and um, discovered early that I wanted to be a, an underwater photographer, storyteller, very lofty dream in hindsight, uh, didn't know anybody and didn't have any connections in the business or any idea how to do it, but sort of chipped away at it. And um, fast forward, I, I you know finally got my first assignment with National Geographic Magazine in 1998 um, and Secrets of the Whales is my 28th um, story for National Geographic. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about how I grew it up to the series and the book and everything else. But um, yeah, I now live on the coast of Maine um, and continue to, you know, try to chip away at these stories that, that interest me and that I think have relevance out there. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, Brian. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Raphael. I'm the composer for the show. Um, I, I've i been doing music my whole life, so it's a little difficult to just tell you like this started, you know, at this very specific moment in my life. Uh, but um, um, I, I, I had a like, not a really typical journey because I started doing music when I was a only a kid, because of hearing issues, um, which is funny, because the underwater the you know where the whales live if there's one place I can't go on earth that's you know that's it because I cannot go underwater because of my hair so that made it interesting um and and yes I I I started being a full-time composer five years ago and Secrets of the Whales is my first uh really uh project that you know of the scale so I'm very proud of, to be part of it um and yes I started uh, scoring for the show uh, exactly a year ago so that's uh that's my COVID project <laughs> that's awesome. it's a pretty good one yeah <laughs> really did good. One. I am very lucky and feel very lucky to have it yeah we're, we're lucky to have Raph I mean it's just amazing. <laughs> music is as you all can appreciate of course music is is so inspirational and mm -hmm. it makes or breaks a film really so um, yeah. we're very lucky to have Raph's uh, talent yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we're very excited to talk to you all. And we um, we got to screen the series. Um, and I'm sure all of us have watched it multiple times at this point because we're just so excited about it. Um, <laughs> but I want to hear a little bit of background about like how did this project um, mm -hmm. come to be? Like it's, it's a Nat Geo story, right? But how do you um, how did it turn into a four part series? And it's also going right. to be a book, right? Yeah, the book came out yesterday officially. So, um, awesome. yeah. Um, 
Well, the, the genesis of this, I guess in many ways goes back um, a little over a decade. Um, the first big whale story that I did uh, for National Geographic uh, was a story about right whales. And, and I should point out too that all the stories that I do for National Geographic are my ideas. So I propose stories, write proposals based on things that uh, I'm interested in, I've researched. And then if it gets approved, I go and do it. So Right Whales was published in 2008, and I spent about two years previous, 2006 and, and seven, comparing and contrasting the most endangered whale in the world, the North Atlantic right whale, with their southern cousins, the southern right whales. And in the time since then, in the decade or so since then, I knew that I wanted to do a lot more whale work. I wanted to do a multi-species whale project, but the trick for me was finding the right narrative. I was reading scientific papers and talking to scientists and attending conferences and trying to just figure out how to connect those dots. In 2015, I did a cover story about dolphin intelligence, about dolphin cognition. And I worked with five different species of dolphins in nine locations worldwide. And I approached it essentially looking at this notion of whale culture, but I didn't realize it at the time. I was very clinical about it and just being very scientific. And it was in the couple of years after that, like 2017, 2018, that I really drilled down on this notion of culture. One of the scientists that was really helpful uh, in this was Dr. Shane Garrow, who's a Canadian. He lives in Ottawa, but he spent the last 15 years working with, with uh, sperm whales in Dominica. And, you know, he sort of described it this way. He said, you know, Brian, behavior is what we do. Culture is how we do it. So most humans eat food with uh, utensils. That's behavior. But whether you use chopsticks or knives and forks, that's culture. And he explained that the whales he was looking at, he's identified about a, a couple of dozen families of sperm whales in the Eastern Caribbean that all share the same dialect, essentially the same language, and that they don't intermingle with other sperm whales that have a different dialect. So this reminded me of the, the neighborhoods of New York at the turn of the last century, the Irish, the Italians, all these families that were in little language enclaves. So I began to extrapolate. I looked at other whale species, you know, whether it was orca, humpbacks, uh, beluga whales, and, and saw that there were cultures there as well. So I wrote the proposal first to the magazine. It got approved as a magazine story at National Geographic, but given the scope and scale of what I hoped to achieve, I knew I needed a lot more funding. So I went to the National Geographic Society, proposed a three-year fellowship, something that I don't think they'd ever done before. That got approved. Then I went to the television division and pitched the idea of a documentary. They upscaled it to a series that brought in a production company, Red Rock, and we, we worked together to, to figure out what the, what the stories were gonna be. Then I went to the book division and, and you know, pitched the idea of doing a book um, as well. So fortunately, all three things um, were greenlit. And you know, the good news was you know, some of the best days of my life was when each of those individual projects got, got approved, you know, and then you wake up the next morning and you, you say, oh God, what did I do? You know, now I have, to, I have to spend three years, 24 locations capturing culture in Wales. I remember sitting down with the director of photography at lunch at the National Geographic uh, uh, ca cafeteria one day before I had proposed it. And she said, so what do you want to do next? I just come off doing four big shark stories in a film. And, and she said, what do you want to do next? And I said, well, I got this idea about whale culture. And she's like, puts her fork down and she's like, you can't photograph that. How are you going to photograph world culture? You know, and, and and it made me pause for a while. So anyway, long story short, divine intervention. We we got it. So there you go. So it's awesome. like this giant snowball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, somebody somebody once told me I used to work on a charter boat in Rhode Island to take people out shipwreck diving, and the captain, a very gruff old salt. He used to say, you know, when he would see somebody come in with a giant fish, he would always say, you know, the dumb of the potato, the, the dumb of the farmer, the bigger the potatoes. So, uh, <laughs> so I sort of feel like that. I proposed this uh, this thing that was probably not realistic, but we pulled it off. So awesome. So it took three years to film. Um, how many weeks did you spend in each place? I mean, some of the footage you have, I'm like, man, how long did you have to wait for that? <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, it's a really great question. And I don't know that I have the answer on, on how much time collectively. It was three years, 24 locations for everything. And in some places, 
Um, the, the least amount of time that I spent in a place, believe it or not, was uh, New Zealand for orcas when we got the stingray sequence of, of that female orca sort of dropping the ray and uh, appearing to feed me. Um, that just got very, we got very, very lucky. Other places um, like Dominica with sperm whales, I went back uh, three or four trips for maybe a collective total of three months, you know, and in, in one of those trips, I, I remember the first year I went there for a month, I came away with one picture that I was happy with. The second year I said, I'm going to go back for five weeks. And I think it was 19 days before we saw our first whale. I remember Shane Garrow, the scientist I was working with saying, well, this has never happened before, you know, which is not uh -huh. what you hear. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, but it, as you all know, it does take time, right? I mean, these things mm -hmm. reveal themselves in their own good time and, and you just have to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I the think more time Slater you spend out there, the, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. I think Slater has a follow-up question about your, um, your killer whale encounter. Oh, yeah. So when she initially brought the ray over to you, were you immediately thinking she's bringing you food or what were your kind of your thoughts at that moment? Yeah, no, I, I wasn't thinking that. So just again, for some context, um, this was in 2019 and I had been traveling every single month of the year. So I started off the year, I don't know, I think I was in Dominica and then I was in Sri Lanka and then I was in the Azores and then I was in the Canadian Arctic for six weeks. Then I went home for a day after the Canadian Arctic and then to New Zealand. Um, we're, we're living in a motel with the crew and um, working with Dr. Ingrid Visser, who's dedicated her life to, to these animals in New Zealand and worldwide. Um, and the way it would work is we would get a call that somebody has seen orca in a given place. So that particular morning, I think the call came at maybe 6 a.m. We had the trucks and cars packed from the night before. So we jump in the vehicles. We had to drive about three hours to get there. We get to the boat ramp. She's putting her rib in the water. It's a bit of a fire drill we're running. I get on the boat with the cameraman, Kina Skole, a fantastic uh, Kiwi director of photography underwater. And we go out and, you know, Ingrid positions the boat. She gets us in the right place. You know, we're anxious to get in the water, but she's like, wait, wait, you know, let's, let's do this right. Let's give them enough birth. Um, finally, we slip in the water. I don't even see Kina. Uh, he's good at, at sort of just disappearing and getting this footage. He's rolling the whole time. I don't even know it. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing this female orca coming toward me with the ray in her mouth. And, you know, my mind is exploding. I can't believe what I'm seeing. I mean, the chances of ever seeing this at all is, is, is extraordinary. And now she's coming right toward me. And as she gets closer, as you see, she drops it. But I didn't think that, you know, that was on my behalf. I thought she was done eating. You know, I figured that she's moving on. And so, I just said, well, I'm going to go down and, and, and kneel next to that stingray in hopes that maybe she's going to come back. So I'm in maybe 30 feet of water, kind of a sandy kelpy bottom. Out of the corner of my right eye, I see this giant orca appearing and she just swims behind me. I lose sight of her for a moment. Now she appears out of my right uh, left eye and comes around and stops directly in front of me. So now there's the whale, there's the ray and there's me. And we're just, it's like a Mexican standoff. She's looking at me, she's looking at the whale. I mean, the ray, me, the ray, me, the ray. And then it's, it's kind of like, well, if you're not gonna eat it, I'm gonna go back. And she picks it up very gently, lifts it up in front of me. And she's sort of backlit, the sun's behind her. So I'm trying to get the exposure right to get a picture. Um, Ken is, I don't even know he's there but he's rolling the whole time, thank goodness. And, um, and then she turns and, and feeds with one of the members of her family. They do some food sharing. And we're getting this from the drone perspective above as well and all of that. You know, it was only after, I think, um, that I sort of processed what was going on and said, you know, it almost seems like an offering. Uh, I think James Cameron mentioned that after when we talked. He said, you know, many cultures um, do this sort of offering of food and maybe that's what was going on. So yeah, you couldn't script that obviously. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. <laughs> wow. Incredible. Thank you. Um, I know we're just about out of time. Do we have time to ask um, Roth just one question Please. if we could? Um, so I have, I, we've, we've never really worked um, or interviewed people that work in composing. So I just curious, like, what is your composing process like? Like, do you watch the footage ahead of time or do you have like music in mind already based on the concept or like, how, is it back and forth? Like, how does it work? Well, for like, usually what I do is that and that happened for that project too, is that I, I like to just 
um, be on me on my piano when I get the first footage, you know, I'm going to have to score. And basically what happens is that I want to be, I want to have to, you know, I want to go with the flow and just write my music the first time I see the pictures. And I know that it's kind of that controversial because a lot of composers don't do that. Uh, I don't know if it's a standard process or not, but um, I, it, it's just how I feel about it. I want my raw emotions, the, the first one that, I, that are, you know, triggered by the show and the images, you know, to be reflected in my music. And, and it usually is this way that I get the most interesting themes or, you know, I'm, you know, uh, interesting music. So that's, that's, that's usually my process. But this time I couldn't help, you know, as a composer and a French person also to just go back to the big blue and this movie in the eighties, you know, um, with this incredible score by Eric Serra, who created these whale sounds out of synthesizers. Like they're not real sound. They're not like, uh, proper whale sounds and so I I was it was so tempting to do the same or actually or even try you know to do, use the same process and it kind of did and um and so I think that the only thing that was kind of calculated was this these like songs that I absolutely want to try with synthesizers and they're they're really they're not sound effects I really tried I really tried to have them be instruments <laughs> instead of like another you know animal <laughs> So great. Awesome. You yeah, it awesome. came out beautifully. So well done. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you both so much for chatting with us. We're so excited for the series to come out to everybody. Oh. And um, yeah, we're excited for our listeners to be able to hear from both of you as well. That was super cool that we got well, to chat with all of you. Well, th thank you all. I mean, I personally could, could talk all day. I mean, yeah, this <laughs> we could too, trust us. Just getting started. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. But um, but thank you yeah. very much uh, for everything. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a real pro pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank right. you. Thanks to the both of you. We hope you guys enjoyed that brief interview with Brian and Raphael. We look forward to the air date, April twenty second, Earth Day. And Eric, Adam, Caitlin, and I will be doing a full episode on the entire series. And yeah, we're super excited about it. It looks and so good. It's really good. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it, it's good. You already saw it. We already saw it. Yeah. It, <laughs> it is it, very it is good. good. Yeah. It is really good. Yes. Am I allowed and, to say um, anything about it? We forgot to say one little spoiler alert before um, we talked to Brian because he does talk a little bit about what happens in the killer whale episode. It's really cool to hear um, from his perspective about the series of events, but um, we don't want to give too much away, but I just had to tell you, sorry, there's a little spoiler in there. We, we'll put a warning in the comments or something when we put the episode out, but wow. yeah, well, super excited. Well, 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 spoilers. Wow, Eric, that's messed up. What that's Eric not say? what happened. <laughs> What did you say? I said all the whales die at the end. It's not true at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so excited for that super cool opportunity. Um, we tried not to fangirl too hard talking to um, Brian and Raphael, but um, they, it was amazing to be able to chat with them. So um, we're stoked to bring you guys along on the journey, and we can't wait for you to see the series. Yaw yeet. <laughs> <laughs> That's Slater's new thing in case you guys don't know what just happened. So um, thanks everyone for listening and stay tuned for more information coming out about Secrets of the Whales. We're so excited. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.